people to pop in. But while we're waiting for people to do that, I um, just want to make, well, first of all, welcome everyone to uh, this month's roundtable, scientific roundtable. Uh, just to remind everybody, there's some new resources up on the website uh, relevant to today's talk, some new iPS cells uh, with uh, different PKD mutations, um, reversible PKD1, PKD2 mutations. Reminder that uh, the uh, new clinical resource and biomaterials um, information is up on the site. A new uh, missense variant is available. Uh, and a whole series of new antibodies for PKD1 um, are up on the website. So please check those out. Uh, if Also, if there's resources that anybody in the field would like to have us consider to build, please reach out to us and, and we'd like to hear about them. Our next uh, roundtable will be December uh, 2nd. I will be presenting from uh, WashU. Interesting today, it's University of Washington. Um, but with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker, someone who really doesn't need an introduction to this group. Um, you'll recall that he was, I believe, the ASN Young Investigator, what, two years ago, a year and a half ago? I can't remember when it was, but recently. So congratulations on that award. Very well deserved. Dr. Benjamin Urbino, as we all know him, uh, Freeman, for Associate Pro Professor at the University of Washington. And he will be telling us about organoid-based models to study uh, human PKD. So, Bino, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Brad, for that kind introduction. And, yeah, it's, I, I feel like uh, one of the family in the RRC. So, uh, great to be here. You even got a T-shirt, Bino. I know. I know. <laughs> I have a T-shirt now. You are now an official member. So, there we go. <laughs> Which I will be sporting. Um, yeah, and, you know, thanks for coming the day before the election. You know, this is hopefully something a little bit more fun to talk about than, uh, than sitting on our nails. Just a few disclosures here. I think everybody here understands that kidney, kidneys are highly complex organs and that we need to study them, but they are also very challenging to study. I think that piece of it, for me... Uh, I learn more and more about every year and appreciate more and more. So really a, a beautiful and complex organ that's taken, you know, millions of years to evolve. And we're really only beginning to understand it. And uh, several years ago now, almost a decade ago, uh, we devised a protocol to differentiate pluripotent stem cells uh, into these kidney organoids, as we call them. They kind of like little primitive nephrons in a dish. And uh, the way my protocol works is uh, plating cells in an adherent culture and allowing them to round up in a very thin layer macrogel sandwich. So they form these little spheroids. And then these are induced to differentiate into a mesenchymal population uh, with a GSK3 beta inhibitor. And uh, that results in an epithelial to mesenchymal transition and subsequently re-epithelialization of these uh, cells into these uh, clusters of tubular structures. And when we go and stain those clusters, we can identify nephron segments that are characteristic of kidney tissue. And uh, they appear in the uh, expected proximal to distal segment orders that we would normally see in those tissues. And that's, why, that's how we know their, their, their kidney. Uh, they're not as sophisticated, of course, as actual kidney tissue. There's some parts missing. Uh, you'll see here the podocytes, for instance, have holes in them in the tissue. Uh, those holes correspond to the capillaries. Uh, there are no such capillaries inside the clusters of podocytes found in the organoids. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they're pretty sophisticated. And uh, I think this gives us new ways to study the organ that weren't previously possible. And over the years, we've appreciated that it's not just epithelial structures that arise in these organoids, uh, but also uh, a significant stromal population, uh, which includes endothelium. So even though there aren't actual capillaries, there are a lot of these endothelial cells that uh, are associated with the organoids in a relatively specific manner. 
And uh, when you compare these organoids by single cell seq to developing human kidneys, uh, we see many of the same cell types. So uh, we're, we're, we're very confident that these are indeed uh, early stage kidney structures that are forming in the, in the Petri dish. Uh, you can also appreciate here in this image on the left that among the epithelium, uh, we occasionally see these uh, parietal epithelial cells surrounding the podocyte balls. And uh, those are actually uh, a specific uh, Bowman's capsule-like type of uh, arrangement. So they're beautiful to look at, but what can they actually do? Uh, right now, they can't do all that much. They can't uh, generate urine or anything like that. Uh, but we do see absorptive processes and solute transport functions uh, in these organoids, which are at least reminiscent of the, of the types of functions we would think about in the kidneys. So in the top here, we're actually flowing over uh, this organoid, a volume that contains uh, fluorescent glucose and dextran, and you can see the uptake of those molecules into the tubular structures within the organoids. Uh, on the bottom, uh, these are organoids that we treated with forskolin, and uh, you can see that they are swelling up and uh, essentially expanding uh, in response to that increased signal, and, and they're essentially filling up with, with fluid. So we do think that they have some potential to function as well, and that's still a developing area for these organoids. So getting into polycystic kidney disease, you know why we're all here today, uh, I'm, I'm going to make the somewhat bold statement that it remains poorly understood. Uh, we do know, of course, that fundamentally uh, there's this polycystin complex. I don't think we understand very well what is upstream or downstream of that complex and how that results in cyst formation from tubular structures uh, along the length of the, the nephron and the kidneys, as well as in other organs. Um, there, the cilium is certainly uh, a site, if not the primary site, where these proteins are functioning. Um, but what is it that the cilium is actually doing here? How, why, why is it important? I don't know. Maybe Brad has some ideas. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly find this very mysterious and fascinating. And I think one of the things that's held back the field is that cell lines, uh, if we just take simple cells from patients, uh, they, they have a very limited ability to form uh, cysts in a PKD specific way. And uh, as a result, we don't have a very robust in vitro assay for PKD. So uh, when we first formed these organoids, we had also generated uh, polycystin 1 and polycystin 2 knockout lines, and uh, with the idea that maybe these would actually recapitulate some feature of the disorder. And uh, if you look here at this movie on the left, you can see what my initial observations really looked like. This is taken over many uh, days and sped up, about uh, two weeks in culture. But what we observe is that initially the organoids form the tubular structures normally. Then there's just this this expansion of the structure into a little, little cyst on the side. And uh, that, that was observed in many organoids over the dish. It wasn't every organoid, uh, but we saw several structures like that. And uh, when we quantified this all the way here on the right, uh, we could see that both in the polycystin 1 and the polycystin 2 knockout lines, uh, there was uh, the appearance of these cysts at a significant rate among the organoids, around 10%, 10 to 20% in this culture condition. And what was significant is that in the isogenic wild type lines, we didn't see uh, any cysts forming. Uh, when the cysts were, were stained with uh, a marker for proximal tubule, shown here in green, this is LTL, uh, we could see that the cyst cells were contiguous with the epithelium of the, uh, of the organoid tubules and expressed lotus lectin. Uh, yet they were these large hollow structures. So this was enough to convince me that uh, we were looking at uh, PKD in a dish. And when I look back at this uh, 
finding, I think what comes home to me is that it teaches us that PKD cyst formation is a fundamental process. And we can recreate this with cells in a Petri dish. Uh, it doesn't actually require flow. Uh, you know, it doesn't require a vasculature. Uh, there's something about this that is very basic. And, uh, you know, we can actually uh, essentially reconstitute it. So in that experiment, the work was done in an adherent culture condition. And as I said, the, the cyst formation rate was detectable, but it was relatively low. But we noticed that there was sort of this lifting off process that happened uh, when the cysts were forming. That, that little cyst seemed to pop off the plate a little bit. And this gave us the idea to try this experiment where instead of growing them in the adherent culture the whole time, we would release them using a, a, a needle tip into a suspension culture prior to cyst formation. And this is just showing here how we can kind of suck up these organoids off the plate after they're micro dissected and put them in this low attachment plate. Uh, and uh, when we did this, we saw that the cyst formation rate increased dramatically. And it was particularly evident in the PKD organoids, not in the isogenic controls. So these are the kind of rates that you see when we do this micro dissection and suspension culture approach. Now the cyst formation is about 75% in both the PKD1 and PKD2 knockouts uh, and not, uh, not very substantial in the controls. So this taught us that the severity of organoid P PKD really does dep depend on the micro environment in, in some way. And that if you toggle the culture conditions, we can increase the rate or decrease the rate of cystogenesis. And this movie here uh, demonstrates just how large these cysts can get over time. Each one of these structures was born as a organoid of about 100 microns in diameter. And they're now centimeters in diameter. Uh, we've done the math, and we, we see that these have grown about a thousand-fold over a period of a few months. So there's definitely proliferation that continues to go on. And, and you may have noticed, looking at those movies, that the fluid inside the cysts is a different color from the surrounding media. And that's because the cysts are undergoing an active transport process that excludes the phenol red that's present in that media. So they're retaining the functionality of the original epithelium. I think when you look at these cysts uh, histologically, uh, there's evidence that they do resemble human polycystic kidney disease. So here you can see the organoid H&E uh, on the left versus a, uh, an early onset PKD case, ARPKD on the right. And uh, what we observe is that these are essentially single layer epithelia that are forming. Um, and uh, these are deriving from the tubular cells within the organoids. Uh, it's actually a mixture of both proximal and distal tubular cells uh, that give rise to the cysts. And, and as one would expect, uh, these epithelial cells have primary cilia. And we were interested in cilia, so we went on to study what happens if you disrupt cilia in these organoids, and this can be done uh, in a very robust way because the, organ the, the, the uh, organoids are not a living creature. So they can actually grow and survive without a functional primary cilium. So if we disrupt these kinesin-2 subunits, uh, either KIF3A or KIF3B, uh, we get IPS cells that are essentially cilia-free uh, they, they really don't form a, a noticeable primary cilium. Uh, they can still, however, proliferate normally. They're very stable. And essentially, the pluripotent stem cell doesn't care if it has a cilium or not. Um, however, once they are differentiated into organoids, uh, we see a cyst phenotype 
which is very robust. And this is a consistent between these two kinase and knockout lines. Uh, we, we see these same large cysts forming and uh, is quantified here on the right. You can see that the, the number of cysts per organoid in this case is around 50 to 60%, a little bit less than what we see in the, in the PKD knockouts. Uh, it's not clear to me whether that's actually uh, a real difference or just some sort of uh, idiosyncrasy of the cell lines. Um, and these again really get big. And, and this is an example here of one that grew for uh, about uh, nine months and uh, it grew to the size of about a ping pong ball. In this case, we had to move it out of the six wells and into a flask. And it was a sad day when that cyst popped. So over the years, we've tried to get at this mechanism of PKD uh, using various different types of culture conditions, uh, which I think is an advantage that you can try all these different uh, formats for organoids. On the left, these are uh, 384 well plates, which we can use to conduct screening. And uh, these essentially differentiate in these wells and they form these little cystic organoids in the 384 well plate. And then we can follow these organoids and, and, and see how different treatments affect them. And we've identified using the system uh, several different factors that can reduce the formation of cysts or slow them down. Uh, we also have placed organoids in microfluidic devices to see what the effect of flow over the organoids is. And uh, what we observe there is that the flow really stimulates the rapid expansion of these cysts. So they seem to fill up with fluid uh, more quickly under flow. And you don't see that in the controls that don't have cysts. It's really something specific to these uh, cystic organoids. But there was a, a dirty little secret uh, that we were keeping in the field, which is that the uh, when you really look at these cysts and, and check out their polarity, uh, they're inside out. And uh, these are some images. We, we, we came clean with this in a, in a Nature Communications paper uh, a couple of years ago. But, you know, the reason we didn't talk about it until then is because I wanted to understand what was really going on. And I think... Uh, it, it, it's very strange because if you look at the tubules inside these organoids, they're invariably apical in. So they're polarized similarly to what you would get in uh, kidney tissue. And uh, you can see this is not dependent on whether it's a control or a PKD tubule. They're always apical in. But whenever we looked at the cysts, which were kind of popping off of the structures, uh, the cilia were always on the outside. The tight junctions were on the outside. Uh, so it was quite, quite interesting and, and mysterious. And of course, you know, if you look in vivo, uh, the cilia are on the inside of these cysts, not on the outside. And, and likewise, the stroma is actually also inverted. So uh, if you look at the organoid, you can see these stromal cells right beneath the epithelial layer. And those stromal cells are actually supporting that, that cyst layer. And it's the polar opposite of what you see in a tissue where the cyst is hollow and the stroma is on the inside. And in fact, if you think about these cysts as uh, what they would correlate to in the urinary space, essentially the urinary space would be outside of these cysts rather than on the inside of these cysts. So we took some movies to try to understand how this was actually happening. And uh, these are some of those movies. Uh, you can watch them over several days and you can rewind them to try to figure out exactly how the cyst is, is arising from the organoids. And because the whole thing happens in front of you in a microscope, uh, we have this ability to study the formation of the cysts over time. And what we observed is that the cysts arise from the peripheral epithelium of the organoids. And if you look carefully, you can see that it's, you know, in a, in, a, in a structure as it forms, it's these outer layers that swell up and they leave the inner part of the organoid intact. So uh, they form these characteristic structures 
where you can essentially see this involution of the tubules inside the structure, but then these, the, the cells outside expand up to form a cyst. It may be easier to look at in, in a still image here. This is one of those structures. Uh, you can see how there's kind of an involution of a tubule here and then an epithelial layer surrounding it. And that epithelium swells up and expands while that inner tubule remains anchored to the underlying uh, substratum, which is in this case, the tissue culture plate. And then when we followed this with careful immunohistochemistry, uh, we could observe that indeed the peripheral layer of the organoids, even before they form cysts, had uh, outward facing epithelia. And the tubule structures that I described earlier that were apical in, those are actually invaginations of this outer layer of epithelium. So that explains why you can have a cyst that's facing out, but a tubule inside the organoid that's facing it. So uh, I think that that's all very fascinating and worth thinking about, but ultimately for PKD, uh, we would like to have cysts that face uh, their apical sides in, in order to make the system more physiologically relevant. And that's something that we have been working on in the laboratory uh, over the years. And these are some of the more recent data that we've obtained, where if we take these organoids and surround them uh, with extracellular matrix, uh, we're essentially able to toggle the polarity of the cyst uh, to an apical in configuration. Now, notably, the cysts will also form just fine without uh, the extracellular matrix. So they can also form, they can form apical out or they can form apical in. Uh, I think they're essentially agnostic to cell polarity. Uh, you know, that is, that is the conclusion that I would, I would draw from this. Uh, but in any case, I, I, we will be able, I believe, to improve the system and uh, make the cysts more apical in over time. So how is this actually working? Uh, you know, we do have some ideas. And these are some of the hypotheses and, and that, that we've come up with here based on our, our drug screening experiments, as well as uh, these flow experiments and microscopy. Uh, in, in, in the normal situation, uh, the organoids have some potential to absorb things like glucose from the media. And this is followed uh, by uh, water molecules as an equilibrium measure. And uh, what happens in PKD is that these, this, this water absorption results in an epithelial stretch and distension of this peripheral epithelium, uh, possibly due to accumulation of fluid inside those tubules and, and, and essentially no exit valve for that pressure. Uh, this may be related to a contractility defect where uh, essentially actinomycin is not able to withstand those pressures that are arising because of the, the fluid accumulation. Now, how that relates exactly to what's happening uh, inside the body, uh, I would refer to you to, to our paper where we have some theories, but that's, uh, that's not my area of expertise. And I think it's the kind of thing that maybe we could talk about uh, as a community and, and think about whether there are possibilities there. So this is an absorptive model of cyst formation. Uh, it's quite different, I think, from uh, the idea that secretion drives cyst formation in PKD. Uh, I don't think these are necessarily mutually exclusive, but uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about both of these possibilities. And we don't right now know exactly how, how it's working uh, in, in the disease. But I do believe that whatever's happening in the disease uh, must also be happening fundamentally uh, in the Petri dish. So however PKD works, uh, one avenue that I think we can focus on for the PKD organoid model is using it to study uh, therapeutics that could affect uh, the genetic 
mutations present in PKD. And I'll just walk through a recent study that we published earlier this year, uh, which is about nonsense mutations. And uh, these are relatively common types of mutations. These are uh, single base pair mutations that result uh, in essentially a truncated protein that is non-functional. And uh, they arise in the clinic in both PKD1 and PKD2 and result in, in more severe phenotypes than non-truncating base, base mutations. So uh, the work that I'm going to talk about was conducted by uh, two people in the lab. Uh, Courtney Vichy, who uh, was an MD-PhD student in our lab, has now graduated, and Charday Thomas, who is a research scientist uh, in the lab currently. And what they did was generate a library of nonsense mutants, uh, IPS cells. And these were generated on, a, on an isogenic uh, background such that we could obtain a wild type IPS cells, homozygous knockout IPS cells in which the, the C has turned to T in both alleles, as well as heterozygous uh, knockouts. And these are very interesting because in, in our previous attempts to use CRISPR-Cas9, uh, we never got very good heterozygous, and not enough where we could assess whether heterozygosity actually results in a phenotype. And you can see here, we did this for two mutations. These are clinically relevant mutations in PKD1 and two in, in PKD2. And these include the most common uh, types of clinically found nonsense mutations for each of these genes. And what we observed uh, when we looked at the allelic series is that the cysts form in homozygous mutants, but not the heterozygous. So you can see here on the left, uh, this is a PKD1 mutant. We've got the allelic series, and uh, the heterozygotes really look very much like the wild type controls, whereas there's a clear difference in the homozygotes. This is all done in the same batch of organoids, same differentiations uh, side by side. We always do things that way. And uh, you can also see here uh, the quantification, the percentage of organoids forming cysts. It's really just the homozygotes that form cysts, uh, not the heterozygotes. And this was an interesting experiment. It taught us uh, that having 50% of the normal protein levels of polycystin 1 or polycystin 2 is sufficient to rescue the phenotype. And you know, I'm not going to show you the protein expression data, but that's in the paper. Uh, so you know, the heterozygosity alone, haploinsufficiency, is not enough to produce the cysts, at least in our system. Uh, and it, it also shows uh, that there, because the homozygotes really do obviously form cysts, I think it supports the notion that you do, uh, that a second hit will really drive PKD. Um, if nothing else, it will make it a much stronger phenotype that can be observed in a short period of time. Uh, I suspect that there is likely some second hit that's also occurring in vivo as many, uh, as many of the researchers on the call had actually shown over the years. You know, we wanted to make, uh, double check this and also do a little bit of a pilot of, of gene therapy for PKD. So we, we performed the reverse experiment. We took our base edited homozygote and performed uh, adenine base editing on them to essentially turn them from homozygotes into heterozygotes. And uh, we saw the same effect. Essentially, heterozygosity rescued uh, this phenotype. I think this is also a very nice uh, and, and the first real uh, experiment that we've ever done that proves that the phenotype we observe is indeed reversible. Now, clinically speaking, uh, we had a strong interest in this because we were collaborating with a company called Elox. And they had developed these glycoside drugs that essentially can read through, they can promote read through of uh, premature stop codons. And the way this works is that normally, you know, the ribosome will encounter a stop codon on the transcript, it'll pop off, dissociate. Uh, but in the presence of these, of these uh, glycoside therapeutics, it essentially tricks the ribosome a little bit into being not that picky. And it'll pick up a cognate uh, tRNA 
and uh, essentially uh, keep on reading uh, through these types of mutations. And what's, what's really neat about these drugs for the purposes of polycystic kidney disease is that they're known to accumulate in the kidneys. So the kidneys are a real interesting site of action for these types of therapeutics. Uh, but animal models of PKD do not exist with such mutations. Uh, therefore, uh, we needed a system where we could test them out, and the organoids were designed to do exactly that. And uh, we tested out two of these drugs. One is called ELOX-02. The other is called ELOX-10. Uh, and uh, what we found in both cases is that add, as you increase the dose of these compounds, uh, we decrease the formation of these cysts. And uh, essentially, if we added them in early, uh, we could, uh, we could, we could uh, block cystogenesis. Uh, if we added them late, we could slow it down. And uh, these were quantified very nicely uh, in these uh, curves, which are essentially dose-response curves for different concentrations of the drug. And we saw that both of these drugs uh, had the same effect, essentially. On, on organoids. And uh, we wanted to make sure this wasn't due to some sort of cytotoxicity that might be sneaking into the system. So in, in cars corresponding experiments, we sampled these treated uh, organoids and performed live dead staining. Uh, we also used a lactate dehydrogenase assay to measure cytotoxicity. And in both cases, we saw that uh, there was very little cytotoxicity uh, uh, you know, up to about 100 micromolar. I think 100 micromolar, we were beginning to get some, some cytotoxic effects. Uh, but we were seeing efficacious effects down to 10 micromolar. So we believe that these are, uh, there, there was a true measure of efficacy here uh, for both of these compounds. It wasn't just some sort of toxic side effect. And last, uh, we examined whether the drugs could restore the levels of polycystins uh, in these uh, organoids. And, and here we did essentially Western blotting. And uh, we observed that as we titered in the compound, uh, we did see a rescue in the expression uh, of polycystin 1. And you can see that uh, pretty clearly here compared to the wild type. So the levels of, of PC1 uh, were going up. This was a little harder to detect uh, with PC2. But well, we did see some evidence as well uh, that PC2 could be uh, restored. So the conclusion uh, of the talk is really that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, we recognize the, the organoids are not perfect. Uh, nevertheless, we believe that they have advantages that need to be considered and uh, can give us new perspectives on polycystic kidney disease. You know, we've already learned quite a bit about what isn't necessary in PKD. Uh, I, I think we'll learn more about what is necessary over the next five years or so. And we're currently just starting a project to establish these mini kidneys as drug development tools uh, that could be used by the FDA, even at the later stages of drug development. So really going from uh, in, in the preclinical stage uh, into late stage clinical trials. And uh, that's ongoing work that we're very excited about. So I think that PKD organoids are kind of leading the way in the kidney organoid field uh, in terms of drug development tools. Uh, a lot of this has been done within the university, but over the years I've gathered an appreciation for what commercialization can do. And uh, a couple of examples of this, you know, early on the methodology that I developed to differentiate uh, iPS cells into organoids, uh, we teamed up with stem cell technologies and they have now developed this into a commercially available kit. Uh, you can see here the kit only has three components. So it's really a relatively simple kit. Uh, we've used this in my own laboratory. And uh, I would encourage you to try it if you're uh, you know, working with organoids uh, or working with iPS cells and interested in modeling PKD. Uh, the other venture, which is more recent, is that we have spun out a company called Plurexa. Uh, I'm uh, the chief executive of the company currently. And the idea here is that we can conduct these types of experiments at a larger scale for the community, uh, for people who might be developing therapeutics for PKD, for instance. Uh, we're also generally interested in uh, tools that could be used 
uh, to model PKD. And these are just some of the details about the company in case you're interested. Uh, you know, it works essentially like a, a small uh, a grant application type of system. Uh, the work would be conducted fee for service and uh, we're fined with de-identified materials. Uh, you know, we aren't interested in, in uh, keeping any of the rights to anything that anybody uh, sends into us. And the idea is simply to uh, make the technology available in a way that wouldn't really be possible uh, to many laboratories. Uh, so that's all I have, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I did want to make sure to thank everybody who's been very involved in the project, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb, who has been a really great mentor to me, uh, Dr. Hong Shifu, who has uh, been conducting experiments on organoids since the beginning and is really our, our resident biophysicist who helps us understand the mechanobiology of this work. Uh, within the laboratory, we've had a really great team. I'd say about half the lab at any time is, is working on PKD. And uh, these are just uh, some of those names, the more recent uh, participants involved. Uh, and we've had some great collaborations, uh, at least only a few of which are listed here. Um, and uh, I'll thank you for your attention and we can uh, we can talk about uh, the system. You know, thank you very much. So for questions, I ask you to please unmute yourself and ask the questions directly. I think it fosters better dialogue and discussion between the speaker and the questionnaire. And I'm going to start off with a question, take my rights as the moderator here, with these read-through drugs. Have you tried yet to have the cyst form, then treat? Does it regress with that approach, similar to what was shown in the mice? Well, we don't we we don't see a lot of shrinkage. We do see occasional shrinkage events, uh, so those are increased. If you if you look at the wider population, you say, does any of them do any of them shrink? The answer is yes. Do they shrink uh, on average? The answer is no. Uh, I think that's to be expected because read-through is not very efficient, right? So it's nowhere near as efficient as what we see, uh, you know, in Steve Somo's papers, for instance, when, you know, we are re-expressing PKD2 at high levels. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Yeah, very nice talk. So, you know, my lab is using the base editor to correct the mutations in vivo. So my question is that uh, you using the organoid to test the base editing and uh, how you deliver the, the base editor to your organoid? So we do the base editing in the pluripotent stem cell stage and it's all delivered uh, essentially with plasmids. So we just uh, uh, express both the base editor as well as the guide RNA uh, using DNA plasmid transfection. And then we isolate different clones of the pluripotent stem cells and screen those with Sanger sequencing. And Sanger sequencing works beautifully for looking at base editing. So that's another big advantage of that technology, way cleaner than conventional CRISPR-Cas. Um, but we don't have a way yet of delivering these editors in, into the organoids in their mature state. Uh, which is, I think, what you guys are talking about doing. That would be very interesting, but but we're not uh, we're not able to do that yet. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Uh, thank you very much, Bino. It's always an enjoyment to listen to your project and how it's developed over the years. Uh, you mentioned that you think that the polarity is agnostic as far as cyst formation. Do you think that? And cis formation is strictly driven by the proliferation of the cells and that fluid accumulates by multiple different approaches. Because um, I was interested in the, the flow versus no flow. If you have the inverted cyst and you increase flow, that would increase the absorption, which expands cis formation. But then in, in PKD, we think that there's a limitation of flow and the, the, there's no flow on them to activate the cilia, and then that contributes to the secretion of fluid. So I was just wondering if, you're, if your thought is that it really doesn't matter as far as the fluid transport and that everything's being driven by the proliferation of the cystic epithelial cells. Uh, you know, it's a great question, Darren. And uh, 
I don't know. I think it's very confusing for me sometimes uh, to, to, to figure out. I, I don't want to say that the fluid transport has nothing to do with it because, I, I you know, it just <laughs> seems to me that it's got to have something to do with it. Um, that being said, how can you have, you know, fluid transport going and, and having the same result when uh, you have two opposite geometries of the cells? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So it, it might be a third thing like proliferation. Um, it also could be a biophysical thing, you know, the, the sort of tension of that epithelium that's occurred to me as well. that maybe it's just a little looser. Um, you know, the proliferation piece, I will say it's not very fast in these, in these cultures. Uh, you know, the increase in proliferation is like you go from maybe, uh, you know, 1% of the cells being mitotic at any time to 2% of the cells being mitotic at any time. You know, I don't know that's really uh, enough to account for the rapid formation of the cysts that we see, which happens essentially as soon as the organoid matures. Um, so I, I think there is a fluid balance that's probably involved that you need some sort of functionality there. Uh, and there's something, something is wrong with the system that, that results in the cyst formation. And it must be, it must be somewhat ambivalent uh, to the actual geometry of the, of the epithelium. I wonder if there'd be any changes in the claudins because uh, those seem to be, regulate re, the regulatory mechanisms for the paracellular pathway. I just wonder if there may be changes in the Claudin expression as well. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that would be good to look at. We have not, we've not looked at the Claudins. Um, yeah, I agree. Dr. Germino. You know, I enjoyed your talk as always. Uh, question for you. So, I mean, I'm looking at the, the KIF3A mutants. It's kind of interesting, um, right? Um, you know, in mice, right, they don't really get cystic disease. Uh, if you use a KSP Cree, so I don't know, P, whatever that day is in, in gestation, right? They get they don't really get cysts, really big cysts until, I don't know, first week, two weeks of life, right? So it's kind of late. And yet these are, you know, these are really early stage kind of structures developmentally. So, and yet you're getting cysts in, in vivo. Do you think the difference is just species difference? You know, humans would get, you know, if we had a KIF3A mutant human, they would have, you know, really embryonic cystic disease or what do you think? Because it's curious, the timing is, is quite different. You're right. It does seem to be more robust in the, uh, in the organoid system than in the mice. Uh, I'm not sure how to explain it. We don't, we don't use a, a, a Cree system, obviously. So right. you're starting off with the full knockout. That may account for some of it. Um, hmm. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I you know, I if think I can, that you, if I can interject there, yeah. I mean, I was gonna say, Brad, please. <laughs> when we do early deletion of either KIF3A or with IFT88, those cysts you get are severe and rapid. Now they're not quite as severe and rapid as you get with PKD one or two, but they are they're large. So what 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 Cree, Cree do you use and what just keg, uh, Cree, keg, Cree, Cree, keg Cree ER? Well, and this is CJ to interject even more. When we first started doing, we were using the Hawks B7 Crees, mm -hmm. and those mice barely made it to weaning age. Huge. With massive cystic right, but, but right, but P21 is like really different than a, in utero, you know, uh, you know, these cysts are these organoids are getting what, maybe second trimester, if that equivalent. Which is why I equate them to like Hawks B7 Cree. Which is but are they born with the Hox B7 Cree? Are they born with big cysts? Yes. Yes. They're born with it. Okay. Yes. Are they, they were a non Cree inducible. They were one of the original Hox B7s and they were very cystic very early from embryonic I, stages. I think it's going to be related to the timing. Um, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interject there, but that's sorry. what we see. Uh, Leaf. Hey, Bino. I'm curious about um, exactly what happens in that first, you know, the first snapshot of when the cell when you find the cells with the uh you know with the with the primary cilium on the side that you would expect to be basal i didn't really get that from the pictures that you saw i i i understand that you know 
you can find them with all, uh, you know, acetylated tubulin or all 13 B where you would expect them to be basal. But do you ever see like mixtures of cells that are facing uh, different directions? Or like, how do you, how do you visualize that very first step that, you know, because you are basically going from a ball, which you're showing with apical cilium inwards to a ball with apical cilium outwards? Well, the, the ball starts off with some apical cilia on the outside. I think that's at least part of the answer. You know, there are parts of the organoid that just form apical out. And that's normal. That's normal for anything. You know, cells will polarize against the stiffest thing in their neighborhood, right? Oh, I didn't mean to do that. But <laughs> hey, all right, I'll go with it. Um, happens often in these conversations. Uh, so, you know, cells are going to polarize towards the media. And that's what's happening even in the wild type organoids as they form. Um, and then I think it's that combination of having a PKD mutation on top of that. So those cells that are facing out, they end up swelling up. And the stuff that's inside the ball that's facing apical in, it's not doing the swelling. At least that's what I, I believe is occurring. Do you think that the uh, so you do your 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 organoids are embedded in matrigel, correct? They they have a very thin layer of matrigel. Yeah. I think by the time the organoid has formed, it's probably non-existent. Okay, you know, they've broken through that little mound of matrigel. Yeah, okay. They start out with the yeah, okay. Good. They're like okay. hills. Yeah, you know. Dr. Lipschitz. Hi, Reno. You know, great talk. Um, so the MDCK cells way back in the 1990s, James Nelson grew them in um, in medium and got the same inside out phenomenon. So, it, so it's probably just like you're saying, when you have extracellular matrix, then it reverses, right? So it's, is that is that the idea that it has nothing yeah, to do with exactly. the necessarily, but the medium? Exactly. Yeah. I think if you have like something around them that will push them to polarize, you know, right side in, uh, you know, then they will form in that manner. And we should be able to get cysts to form as well that are, are, are closer to what we see. But I think it's very curious that actually the easiest ways that we've been able to get the cysts to form are inside out, you know. And I'm still not sure the right side in ones will form with the same level of, uh, you know, fidelity to the, to, the, to the actual disease phenotype. Is it difficult to code them with the extracellular matrix? No, no, it's not. It's not difficult. Um, you know, you have to you have to figure out which extracellular matrix is the right one, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. But uh they're very easy to manipulate and, and, and play around with. And there's really a million ways that they could be played around with. Uh, I think that's part of the fun of the, the system. Yeah. Dr. Zhao, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like with this new version, I don't know how to do the uh, animated uh, hand up. Uh, it's been a very nice talk uh, as usual. Uh, I was just wondering, um, what would the tumorous segment these cysts uh, represent, uh, both LTDBA or uh, one of the kind? Yeah, it tends to be both. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the LTL and the DBA and the organoids are not, not completely separate from one another. There is some overlap between those two, those two markers within the organoids. And when things turn into cysts, it really, they really tend to overlap. I think there's actually some level of dedifferentiation that must be going on, uh, you know, sort of similar to what, uh, you know, Cat Hop and uh, Peter Harris have shown in the PKD1RCRC, right? When they do these sort of long-term analyses of where the cysts are coming from. But we definitely see it in both. 
Um, I think actually in uh, 2008 or 2007, when we published the first uh, uh, our, our, our line of uh, uh, PKD1 frog smiles, we noticed the transition of uh, cysts from proximal to distal. But I was wondering, because everyone is curious, is about the reversed polarity. And I was wondering whether there is any connection with, uh, you know, with uh, the tubular segment, but sounds like there is not, is that right? Josh, your hand is still up. I don't know if you have another question. No, you're muted, but- No, I'm good. sorry, I'll, I'll lower my hand. <laughs> Jing doesn't know how to raise her hand. I Josh. don't know <laughs> what happened that. with this new version. You get those two together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can only do the thumb up somehow. <laughs> All right. Um, other questions? So I guess Bino just, oh, to, there we go. We got <laughs> thumbs up. I agree. Um, I guess kind of ending on this, Bino, one of the questions I kind of always ask at the end is if there's something that the consortium could do to help your research program move forward. And I think one of the things I heard would possibly be a mouse that would be relevant for your read three drugs in one of the polysystem mutations. Um, I do think that would be very interesting to have such mice. Um, there may be some of them in the works, but I don't think there have been many. Yeah. So I do think that would be interesting. You know, those types of, uh, and I think, uh, you know, kind of getting at what Dr. Lee was mentioning, you know, we would be interested in, 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 in ways of, uh, conducting, you know, things like gene editing. In, in, in the uh, PKD organoid system. That may be a little bit beyond sort of the, the typical um, set of tools. Uh, but I do think, it, you know, those types of things, being able to really use organoids in different ways from what's been established, we need some technology development there. Uh, I think the some of the work that I've seen in the literature, you know, I don't know what's what's really going on in the PKD RC these days, but, um, you know, I, I, I do, I, I do see that there's an emergence in the literature of, uh, organoid and, and models coming from some of the mice. And I think that's kind of an interesting parallel system. So, you know, the mouse models, uh, you know, could be useful for us to understand, you know, how, what, what that, what the difference is between in vivo and in vitro. You know, I don't know if there's some way to get those types of organoids um, but uh, yeah those are the types of things that come to my mind yep. yeah. I think you. in general having conversations and really thinking about what's happening you know with with you guys and seeing all these different types of complementary systems you know if we could actually figure out, what the mechanism is of cyst formation in the organoids, and, you know how it could be apical in or apical out. That would be interesting as well. You know, we do have theories about absorption in the context of mice, which would be interesting to test. We don't have the tools to do that, but you know, is it possible that there is more absorption in a PKD kidney? Um, in vivo. That would go completely opposite of what the current thoughts are on cyst promotion and fluid secretion. Um, but it's an interesting idea. Josh, <laughs> his hands back now, up. Now, now I really have my hand up. So, so when you did the flow experiments, if you did the flow experiments when you made the polarity normal, would you still see changes? Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to try. You know, I, I don't know. It's a good question. A good question. Dr. Wallace. We actually kind of have to redo a lot of experiments now with this <laughs> apical in polarity. Yeah, kind of talking about that, Bino. So um, back when I was with with Grantham, we we did some experiments where we grew cells in agros, and the cells would invert their polarity, so the the uh, cilia would be on the outside of the cysts, and so we we did that to isolate absorptive uh, cell types. And then you can grow them into culture on a two-dimensional support, and they'd actually form domes because they'd absorb fluid. So they had an increased absorptive capacity. And then, of course, if we put them in a collagen matrix, they would form 
uh, cysts with what we consider to be kind of the orthologous orientation. Um, so I wonder if you took your, your organoids and put them in agros where you don't have uh, flow over the primary cilia, would you still see cyst expansion uh, like you do in, in the um, uh, suspension culture? Anyway, that's just, I know you yeah, don't have Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, a lot of interesting ideas there, Darren. And it's interesting that you saw doming too. You know, I am, I am always curious about doming as an assay. So good thoughts. Right, we are right at about the hour. Um, I want to take this time to, again, thank Bino for a wonderful talk, as always. Um, appreciate the insights. And Bino, if there is ever anything we can do as a center to help uh, your research, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, and thank you for a wonderful discussion from the, the panel here. So thank you, guys. See everybody in about a month. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, Brad. And I will. <laughs>